Well, welcome today to uh, another presentation at the Charles Red Center for Western Studies. I'm Jay Buckley. I'm the director. We're so excited today to have Professor Erica Ambasumic with us. Uh, she's kind of a homegrown excellence. She uh, did her undergraduate at uh, the University of Utah and received her PhD in history from Rutgers. Then she started at UTEP and is now at Ut uh, University of Texas at Austin. Um, she's the author of three books and numerous articles and essays and digital platforms and op-eds. <laughs> it's a long list, but let me just read a few of the highlights. She's a professor of Native American history, environmental history, history of the built environment, history of the U.S. West. Um, her first award-winning book is Indian Made, Navajo Culture in the Marketplace. 1848 to 1960, co-editor of a collection of essays on the global environment entitled Nation States and the Global Environment, New Approaches to International Environmental History. Her latest book is this one displayed here, uh, The Foundations of Glen Canyon Dam, Infrastructures of the Dispossession of the Colorado Plateau, which she'll be speaking on today. So please give her a warm BYU welcome to Erica Basamic. Okay, um, hopefully everybody can hear me and I'm all mic'd up appropriately. Um, I wanna thank everybody for, I thank you all for inviting me. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Rensick for the invitation, uh, BYU faculty and staff, Utah Humanities um, <clears throat> Council for the institution for the invitation, but I'd also like to thank um, Tom Alexander who read um, the book, he's a former professor here, emeritus professor, he read the entire book and gave me lots of help feedback, Jay Buckley, Brian Cannon, um, everybody at the Red Center who helped me workshop different parts of the book. Um, so I'll be talking about three episodes in the overall, um, that introduce you to kind of the overall narrative arc of the book. But before I do that, I want to start with a land acknowledgement um, because I am talking about Native American history and I think it's um, one of the important things to do. So I want to say that I uh, recognize and acknowledge that I'm speaking on the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. I'm grateful that we can gather here and I respect Utah's indigenous people as the original stewards of the land. Um, each episode of the book that I'm going to be talking about is foundational in specific ways and illustrate um, a particular point that I make in the book. And eventually they'll kind of be woven together. Um, so just kind of, um, you know, it might seem like I'm talking about disconnected things, but at the end you'll see I'll tie them together. Um, but before I do that, I'm going to talk a little bit about my, some personal and scholarly foundations that are fundamental to my work. In any talk about a book, an author really can't cover the entirety of the book. This, so this talk is really meant to introduce some big ideas and cover key episodes in what could be described as the long history of Glen Canyon Dam. So let's look at the dam a little bit. <laughs> um, and lay bare some of the cultural scaffolding that gave, gave rise to the physical structure that has long been controversial and is currently in crisis. And we can talk a little bit about the crisis at the end. As most people in the audience will know, Glen Canyon Dam sits along the Utah-Arizona border. So Lake Powell right there in red, we see Glen Canyon Dam. It was officially proposed in 1946 and it was completed in 1966. Though, as I show in my book, plans for the dam were hatched much, much earlier. It is not an exaggeration to say that Lake Powell and Glen Canyon Dam are in the news almost every single week, um, usually something to do with an environmental crisis. The latest one is the small mouth, small mouth bass crisis. Residents from Utah to California are really wondering what will happen as the water of Lake Powell continues to drop, not if, but when. So currently, the reservoir's water level is 3,573 feet. And I love this illustration from the Salt Lake Tribune, which imagines the dam as a wine glass. Um, um, but it's actually pretty instructive for us because of the way the dam is structured. Um, the majority of the water is in like the bigger bowl, but there is water in what would be the stem of the glass. So we're at 3,400 
at 3,573 feet, minimum power pool is 3,490 feet. And that's what's really important because if the water level drops below that, it will no longer produce electricity. And 40 million people rely on the dam's electricity across from all the way from like Nebraska to California. Um, Drought, climate change, water use habits, all of these things are affecting the current crisis at Lake Powell. And all of these issues are related to the larger topic of my book. So I want to start with, um, I want to now move on to the acknowledgement that a lot of history that scholars write can be very personal. So while this project is a scholarly project, it also rests on a personal foundation as well as an academic one. So one of the questions that I've long wondered about is why does the dam exist? That question was sparked for me um, by the fact that I grew up mostly in Utah. I went to high school in the mid-1980s and college in the late 80s and early 1990s when an author named Edward Abbey, who some of you may have heard about, was all the rage and everybody was reading The Monkey Ranch Gang. And Glen Canyon was something that came up in conversation frequently, although um, usually the conversation was um, from the environmentalists, wasn't it awful that we built this dam in this beautiful place? And from the other side, from recreationists, isn't it amazing that we have this beautiful blue lake in the Sandstone Canyon? So it was kind of controversial in that way. But for me, there's another reason why I think that that question, why does the dam exist, was there. And that has to do with the fact that my parents are both engineers. Raise your hands if your parents are engineers. Okay, a couple of you are going to know what I'm talking about. My brother and I used to jokingly call every road trip we went on a bridge and tunnel tour because inevitably, wherever we went, my parents would find some engineering marvel for us that we had to stop and look at. And then they would talk about what was innovative about the design or how it was revolutionary in some particular way. And they would you know, talk about these things at length with my brother and I in the backseat of the Chrysler Cordoba and try to engage us in this conversation. And I have to say, at the time, we did not think it was all that fun and it seemed kind of boring. Sadly for my son, his mom is a historian, and I do a different version of the same thing now, where I make him stop and look at historical markers, and sometimes I add additional information to those markers, or I even revise them entirely. But that's what historians do. We think about why things exist, what came before, how they've changed over time, how they have been or are represented in public, and what they represent to us today. And we look through various analytical lenses, material, social, cultural, political, economic, environmental. And I kind of do a little bit of all of that using those analytical lenses in this book. In other words, just as engineers might study the evolution of design, historians make connections across time. So even though I didn't love those bridge and tunnel tour <laughs> car tours, I actually kind of have to think, thank my parents for them because they left their mark and they made me think about infrastructure in ways that I might not otherwise. There's another reason why I became interested in the dam. And that has to do with, as a historian whose previous work, uh, whose previous work had focused on the Navajo Nation and the, the Diné, they call themselves Diné, I kept wondering how the history of the dam connected to the history of indigenous people in the region. Um, and if we look at a map of the Navajo Reservation, it's actually not that strange of a question, right? So we have Page, Arizona here, which the Navajo Nation actually um, provided the land of Page, Arizona as a staging ground to the US government in a land swap. So Navajo Nation, you can see this used to be on the reservation. Um, the whole reservation um, basically borders the shoreline of Lake Powell. Um, and when I started to look into this, what is the relationship between Navajo Nation and Glen Canyon Dam, I was kind of shocked and surprised that nobody had really written about it. That there, have been, there are thousands of books and articles and um, commentaries about Glen Canyon Dam, but nobody looked at its relationship to indigenous people. So I kept wondering about that relationship. Um, and it was really difficult to find that relationship. So to understand why the dam was built and what it represents to us, I realized I needed to place the dam in its historical context. And that context is one that includes the indigenous presence in the region, the settlement of the region um, by LDS settlers on the Colorado Plateau, the exploration of it by government officials, scientists and engineers, and years of political wrangling over, the water, and of over water and land in the West, and legal controversies. So this book represents my attempt 
to assert that we cannot tell the story of Glen Canyon, uh, the story of the region's water infrastructure, or regional engineering without acknowledging the indigenous people, the Navajo, the Ute, the Hopi, the Puebloan peoples, who developed deep troves of knowledge about the region's land and water, and we'll see one of those instances today, and how to care and store for it. We cannot tell the story of the dam without acknowledging that almost every group of newcomers to the Colorado Plateau look to indigenous people and their knowledge about land and water before deciding where to build their settlements. And then it was the continued growth of those settlements that gave rise for something like Glen Canyon Dam. More people meant we needed more water and power. When we get more water and power, it meant more people could move to the region. So we begin to see a cycle here. We cannot fully understand the long history of the dam without understanding that scientists and surveyors and geologists and engineers and even environmentalists mined indigenous knowledge about place and the environment as a resource and then often erased that they had done, that, had done so. So a good example of this erasure is the 1963 Sierra Club publication which memorialized Glen Canyon in an award-winning book titled The Place That No One Knew, Glen Canyon on the Colorado. And I already showed you that map so you can begin to see this was not exactly accurate. People did know Glen Canyon, right? Lots of indigenous people knew it well. And they had used the canyon and sites in and around the shoreline of what became Glen Canyon Dam um, for centuries, if not longer. Um, so it was known before the Sierra Club made this state that it, statement that it was unknown. So Navajos, Utes, Paiutes, and Hopis knew it well, and some of the most, most sacred sites are in and around or in close proximity to the canyon. And I'm going to talk about one of those sacred sites today called Seinani Ahagi. Um, people, uh, we know it, um, non-Native people know it as Rainbow Bridge. Um, so knowledge and reverence of place, however, did not mean that the region's indigenous people were unwilling to embrace technology that would alter the face of the red sandstone walls of the canyon. In fact, Navajo Nation leaders, as I already told you, actually supported the dam initially and engaged in that land swap um, to help the government. They wanted jobs, they wanted concessions, so they wanted um, um, uh, to get something for their people. All right, so that's personal foundations and how I came to write the book. Now I'm gonna tell you a little bit about scholarly foundations. I promise not to talk too much about this. But my book falls in the category of what would be called settler colonial studies. And I'll just take a brief moment to define what settler colonialism is. Settler colonialism is a form of colonialism where settlers take territory and resources from indigenous people in order to foster their own permanent societies. One of the core ideas of the field of settler colonialism comes from a scholar, an Australian scholar named Patrick Wolfe. In Wolfe's words, settler colonizers come to stay. Invasion is a structure, not an event. And it's kind of like a mantra of the field, um, which is meant to convey that settler colonialism is an ongoing process that unfolds over time. On the Colorado Plateau, I demonstrate that settler colonialism um, has an infrastructural component as well as a structural one, one that combined both social and physical infrastructures. So across the Colorado Plateau, white settlers worked to establish their own religions and laws, um, social infrastructure, build, uh, build up their own science and engineering, social to physical infrastructure, and build roads, dams, and irrigation projects that embedded their culture and their ideas about land and water use into the landscape. So in, in doing so, they attempted to replace indigenous societies with their own values and laws and ideas about land and water use. And it's important to recognize that this was never a totalizing process, that indigenous people still remain on the landscape, that they still um, have their culture, but that the fact that the government, settlers to the region, did in fact displace and dispossess indigenous people of their land and resources had devastating effects on those indigenous people. Okay, so episode one. Um, to understand why the dam was built, uh, we need to understand a little bit more about the original inhabitants of the plateau and the settlers they came into contact with. But if we start the study, or the, the story with white settlers, we potentially overlook the fact that Navajos have lived uh, in the Four Corners region for centuries. Their homeland is roughly defined by four sacred mountains, Blanca Peak in south cent uh, central Colorado, which we see on the map, uh, Mount Taylor in northern New Mexico, San Francisco, Francisco Peak in northeastern Arizona, and Mount Hesperus in southeastern Col southwestern Colorado. Together, these mountains bound Deneta, the Navajo's homeland. 
Navajos originally interacted with ancestral Puebloan peoples and thrived until the Spanish destabilized regional relationships. Navajos, however, also acquired horses and sheep from Spanish and became successful herds people, agriculturalists, skilled weavers, and silversmiths. Additional destabilization occurred during what are called the Mexican and American periods in American history, especially during the Long Walk era, um, when uh, about 10,000, 8 to 10,000 Navajos were imprisoned by the federal government at Fort Sumner in New Mexico. And so here we see a photograph of that um, prison camp. The story of Latter-day Saint settlers and indigenous people is the story and history of many converging timelines. But for the purposes of the talk today, I'm going to focus on an early phase of LDS settlement in Utah and the larger cont um, contours of settlement patterns that got deeply rooted, uh, that deeply um, uprooted the lives of local indigenous people. So if the first stage of LDS migration was the search for a Latter-day Saint homeland and their arrival in Utah, the second stage focused on the peopling of the surrounding areas to ensure continuation of the faith. And so we, um, we know this as this called, sometimes this slide is called like the Mormon corridor, um, where we can see settlement patterns, the deeper, the darker red areas are um, density of um, LDS um, population. So, you know, as settlers spread throughout the region, um, uh, they spread across the Southwest. Um, they saw the extensive Native American presence in the region. So I'm going to be talking about the region of Southern Utah and Northern Arizona prim primarily. Um, and they saw the presence of indigenous people as proof that their, their mission into the desert could be successful. To put it plainly, if the region could support indigenous people, they re reasoned it could support LDS settlers. In 1854, for example, Brigham Young directed William D. Huntington to lead a trek into what is now northern Arizona to establish trade relations with area Navajos. Huntington was not able to do that, but he did go on a kind of trip of discovery, as he called it, and he found located lots of what he called Indian ruins, um, which we would call pre pueblo structures today, and it solidified his belief that um, people could build their communities on lands that had supported Native people for generations. The remains or ruins of those or their former homes, as well as the presence of existing communities, including their large livestock herds and their irrigation ditches that he stood and documented, that he um, found and documented, stood as proof that the entire area was capable of supporting white settlement. Just a few years later, LDS communities laid down roots in southern Utah and northern Arizona. Once there, white and uh, indigenous populations competed for food and water and resources. Sometimes they fought over them. Indigenous people occasionally turned to violence against each other, encroaching on each other's lands, um, or against the settlers and vice versa. By the mid-1860s, Southern Utes, Paiutes, and Navajos were really struggling to compete with fast-growing white populations who had moved into the area. And Brigham Young recognized that this was happening and remarked on what he saw as an increasingly desperate situation. Quote, this land is their land, Native Americans, and their fathers have walked over and called it their own, and they have just as good of right to call it theirs today as any people have to call any land their own. They have buried their fathers and their mothers and children there here. It is their home, and we have taken possession of it and occupy the land where they used to hunt. But their, now their game is gone, and they are left to starve. We are living on their possessions and at their homes. So this phase of settler settlement started with Latter-day Saints locating indigenous resources, game, water, irrigation ditches, etc., and then taking control of those resources from indigenous people to move there and to support their own communities. This phase of dispossession hinged on the processes of settling the region. And sometimes it is unsettling for us to think about how that happened and what the effects of long-term effects of that settlement meant for indigenous people. And I'll come back to how my own family history is kind of connected here. But it's important that we do so. The Colorado River was a key factor in those settlement patterns. And Brigham Young knew that. And here we have Brigham Young at the Colorado River in 1870. Um, he's in the back with his hat there. Um, and Brigham Young had big plans for the Colorado River that I talk about in my book. OK, so we're going to bracket that first episode uh, from the book. And I'm going to talk, we're going to go in a different direction. We're going to talk about the government and scientists now for the second episode. And to do that, I'm going to talk about Rainbow Bridge National Monument. OK, so 
Um, and I'm going to talk about the discovery, the quote unquote discovery of this place called Rainbow Bridge, which became Rainbow Bridge National Monument. Seinani Ahagi, or Rainbow Bridge, that's how the Navajos, what the Navajos call it, is one of the many geological formations. So here it is. Here's the satellite imagery. You can see the big arch there. Um, uh, that is um, uh, important to the region and to Navajos. The Rainbow Bridge National Monument encompasses 160 acre tract of land in southern Utah and is entirely surrounded by the Navajo Nation's reservation. The arch itself stands 290 feet high and is 277 feet across. It's spectacular. Um, it, it, it's often called one of the seven wonders of the world. Given its size, it's been an object of fascination for non-Indigenous um, people since Byron Cummings and William Boone Douglas raced to document its discovery in 1909, and that's what I want to talk about. But before I get there, so here's the bridge, and this, these are the waters of Lake Powell. And one of the things that Navajo Nation, when it engaged in that land swap, wanted the federal government to do was protect Rainbow Bridge from the water. And I'll talk about uh, a little bit about um, why that became um, important. But it's linked to this, that oral histories and archeological studies demonstrate that the region's indigenous people visited, utilized, and practiced religious ceremonies there for centuries before the discovery I'm about to talk about. All right, so let's go to, so here's Paige, and just to give you some proximity about the location, here's where the dam is, and here's where Rainbow Bridge is. Okay, so let's go to 1909, and um, we have two individuals, uh, Byron Cummings and William Douglas, who raced to become the discoverer of the bridge. Byron Cummings is a archeologist at the University of Utah, and Douglas uh, was working for the USGS. Um, so, knowing of Cummings' keen interest in natural bridges and archaeological sites, two white traders in the region um, actually told them that they had talked to area Navajos, a man um, named um, Sasha Begay, Sharkey, and then a Paiute name, man named Nasha Begay, who had told them of this amazingly large bridge. Um, uh, during his time at the General Land Office, William Douglas had also heard about this massive bridge from a Paiute man named Jim Mike. And we'll see more and hear from Mike a little bit later. In 1909, with Jim Mike, Jim Mike is uh, here with the braids. Um, Jim Mike and John Weatherhill as their guides, Cumming and Douglas, reluctantly teamed up. They really disliked each other. Um, and each man, um, after this arduous journey, they find the bridge, and each man declares himself the, the key discoverer, the first to discover Rainbow Bridge. Um, Aldin Ketchum, who's Paiute Pai Paiute and Jim Mike's great grandson, noted in a conversation in 2019 that it wasn't a fluke that his um, great grandfather knew how to get to the arch. Indigenous people of the region of that of the region had used the arch, taken pride in it, and they were willing to take men, albeit men who paid them to find it. Yet despite their involvement, the involvement of the indigenous guides, and we can see them all here. Um, in their discovery, they were not given credit for that, for their role in this, until much, much later um, in the, um, much later in the 20th century. Um, and in fact, Jim Mike was not paid the $50. He was promised to be paid in 1909 until 1974, when Navajos file a court case against the federal government to protect Rainbow Bridge. And then they bring the over 100-year-old Jim Mike back to Rainbow Bridge. They carry him in a lawn chair back to Rainbow Bridge, put him down in front of Rainbow Bridge, and pay him the $50 that he was promised to be paid in 1909. And he said repeatedly, this would be great if you were paying me the equivalent of the $50 that I was promised to be paid, which would have been $2,500. So why, in 1974, was it important that the National Park Service kind of come back to Jim Mike what was happening in the, 19, um, in the 1970s? So the meaning of the arches discovery was formed within this imaginative framework about the region's future political, economic, and cultural value to non-indigenous people. And we see that kind of happening um, in this next episode that I'm going to tell you, which will hopefully kind of weave some of the, the, the first two episodes that I've told you about together. So Jim Mike getting paid um, in the 1970s introduces us to a key legal question. Um, that, that was in front of the court. LDS settlement and the government's creation of a national monument might seem like two disconnected topics, yet it would be the legal frameworks that the society that gave us both of those things put in place 
that kind of ties these two, two disconnected topics together. And to explain that connection, we have to examine the impact of a late 20th century court case. So important background, going back to that Glen Canyon Dam Act, in that 1956 legislation, the Colorado River Storage Act, it included a provision called Section 1 that where the government pr promised that they would protect Rainbow Bridge National Monument from the waters of Lake Powell. They would either build a diversion dam or they would keep the water low level um, so that that water would not go directly under the arch. And that was really important to Navajo Nation leaders and it was also important to environmentalists who wanted to protect the National Monument. By the 1970s, that had not happened. So, um, so here's Rainbow Bridge and the monument, just one last time. By the 1970s, that had not happened. So this is a map of Navajo Nation, and what we're going to see is members from the Navajo Nation who live in closest proximity to Glen Canyon Dam and Rainbow Bridge, the Inscription House, Navajo Mountain, and Shanto, uh, regions of the reservation, actually come together and file a lawsuit against the federal government. And they're really dismayed about how white tourists, primarily white tourists, are acting when they get to Rainbow Bridge. So the waters have come under Rainbow Bridge and you have a bunch of bad behavior. People take their boats directly under the bridge, they discard their trash, they play loud music, some people swim unclothed there, um, and it's really disruptive for indigenous people who want to hold their religious ceremonies there. Um, so they argue that it's precluding the, them to have their ceremonies altogether. As a result, a group of elders um, actually decide to sue the Department of Interior and the National Park Service who are managing the site. The complex issue of how to balance individual Navajo's active relationship with Sainani Ahegi with the state and federal government's economic interest in Lake Powell was a core interest in the court case which became known as Bodoni v. Higginson. So Lamar Bodoni is the le kind of lead plaintiff. In the case, Navajos claimed that um, their religion was being um, they, they were pro prohibited from practicing their religion and that their Navajo gods who were at, the, uh, who were at Glen, uh, Rainbow Bridge were actually being um, drowned. The final decision in the case rested upon the court's understanding of three things. Three, so these are the three big claims. Land ownership, who actually had a property interest in Rainbow Bridge National Monument, what constituted legitimate religious practice, and the needs of non-Indigenous residents of the Colorado Plateau. And here is what we need to consider. Here's where we need to consider the ways from the 1850s forward the dominant society had constructed social, political, and legal scaffolding that was designed to support settler society's paradigms and erase Indigenous ones. Okay, so the Bodoni case um, were, um, was really important because of a decision that Stuart Udall made. And I'll talk about that in a second, so we'll leave this slide up here. The Bodoni v. Higginson case was first heard in the U.S. District Court in, of Utah in, from 1970 to 1977. When heard, um, uh, and then it was heard in the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals in Denver, um, and they issued their decision in 1980. Chief Justice Alden Anderson wrote the decision for the U.S. District Court in 1977. And Anderson heard testimony from Bureau of Reclamation and Department of Interior representatives, state and government officials, as well as from Navajo plaintiffs. The plaintiffs in the Bodoni case hoped that the judge would restrict the water level in the reservoir from flooding the area under Rainbow Bridge, or a promised diversion dam that was promised in section one of that legislation could be built to protect the stone arch from Lake Powell's um, water. And it was actually Stuart Udall who made that final decision that they were going to let the water flow under the bridge. And Udall's important because he, he, is the, he was both Secretary of the Interior at the time and he's the descendant of LDS settlers into that northern Arizona region. Asserting their historic claims to the landscape around St. Aniahaki, Bodoni and his fellow plaintiffs, so they're going to make a property claim. They're going to say, we actually have claim to this property, said that, quote, the bridge and the monument are located within the boundaries of the Navajo Indian Reservation, end quote. The property claim. Next, they charged that the defendants, operation of Glen Canyon Dam and Reservoir, had resulted in the destruction and desecration of their holy places. So they and their lawyer asked the court to protect their First Amendment right to practice their religion. And what they're really hoping is they can get the water level reduced a little bit. Ultimately, the Bodoni plaintiffs asked the government to protect St. Aniagi and rectify 
the fact that Congress and the Department of Interior had failed to live up to their promises, the promise that Stuart Udall um, ultimately um, reneged on. And Congress just does this in a kind of sneaky way where they just um, refuse to appropriate any funds. And Udall says, just don't appropriate any funds to protect this. So that's why the Navajos are feeling um, particularly aggrieved. That and they can't regulate the behavior. Nobody's attempting to regulate the actual behavior. The court ruled against Bedoni and his fellow plaintiffs. Judge Anderson uh, dismissed the first request for relief by agreeing with the Department of Interior lawyers that Navajos had no legal property claim to Rainbow Bridge because it had been declared a national monument in 1910. So Cummings and Douglas discover the national monument, they find the land, they petition the federal government, it they carve out that 160 acre tract of land. So the government just takes that land away from indigenous people essentially without their knowledge. And we're gonna talk about that in a second. So um, uh, President Taft in 1910 was the one who declared that national monument. Anderson um, put things pretty directly. He said, the court feels that the lack of property interest is determinative of the First Amendment question, and they agree with the, um, they agree with the defendants that the plaintiffs have no cognizable claim under the circumstances presented. While the legal principle was actually really clear, the federal government had managed the site, therefore the federal government had the property claim, not indigenous people, Historically, it's a little more complicated, and that's where history can kind of help us see at least what the indigenous people are arguing. Um, and here, uh, the arguments heard by the court and the outcome of the case expressed in the two separate rulings illustrate how earlier infrastructures of dispossession, such as the declaration of the National Monument um, from indigenous lands in the early 1900s, created the foundation that the federal government could use to solidify their claim to formerly recognized indigenous spaces. So let's go back to that period where Cummings and Douglas are kind of moving around this area. So um, they're around Navajo Mountain, they're looking for Rainbow Bridge. Um, so the government's own indecisiveness uh, in the late 1890s to the early 1900s about who had a recognizable claim to the area surrounding Rainbow Bridge, um, which is located in a tract of land called the Paiute Strip. This is the Paiute Strip right here. Um, is substantially more involved than the court's final ruling indicates or that I have time to go into today. A brief history of federal land designations in the area that encompassing Rainbow Bridge National Monuments um, was complicated even before President Taft signed the proclamation um, carving out the monument from this parcel of land dubbed the Paiute Strip. Um, the name Paiute Strip itself indicates, sorry, I'm going to go back. The name Paiute Strip itself indicates that the government recognized that indigenous people had used the land. Between 1884 and 1933, the government acknowledged that both Paiutes and Navajos had claims to the land. As a result, the government routinely changed the designation of the Paiute Strip back and forth. Paiute, Navajo, um, White, Navajo, um, San Juan, Paiute, etc. In 1884, for instance, uh, President Chester B. Arthur, this is Arthur, um, issued an executive order adding the area known as the Paiute Strip to the Navajo <coughs> Reservation. A few years later, in 1892, due to pre pressure from um, white settlers in the region, it was returned to the public domain by President Harrison. By 1908, Congress uh, slated part of the Paiute Strip to serve as the Paiute San Juan Reservation, which existed only on a paper for a year before it was eliminated altogether. Um, after lo local white settlers and mining and oil interests reacted negatively to the creation of that national monument. The prospectors, those settlers who re rejected that um, idea that this could be indigenous land, were beginning to seek out oil in the region and they represented the very interest that USGS um, and uh, representative and co-discoverer of Rainbow Bridge, William Douglas, here's Douglas here, this, here's our group again, feared. Douglas wanted to protect the area from oil and gas companies. So he pushed for Rainbow Bridge and the area surrounding it to become a national monument. And his, his fears were not unwarranted. But it appears that at no time from the 1880s to the early 1910 were indigenous people consulted about the course of action of creating that national monument on their lands or how to manage them. It is precisely because of the history of dispossession in the region that it was easy for the court to ignore this longer history um, of Navajo and by extension Ute and Paiute and other indigenous claims to the land. An additional complicating factor in the Bedoni case is that second claim about freedom of religion and what constituted um, religion. Um, 
so the um, previous generations had, uh, if we look at Native American history, they did not necessarily believe indigenous people had a, a religion of their own. Um, and they didn't believe that they had a legitimate reason, religion because they weren't Christian in origin, nor did they fit white understandings of religion. In the Bedoni case, the Bureau of Reclamation echoed this idea when it put forth an argument that Navajo religious practices that were happening at the bridge did not meet the legal standard for an organized religion. Therefore, they argued Navajo's claims that the arch was sacred could be dismissed. And Judge Anderson, who endorsed this line of reasoning, and he's doing all of this exactly the way he should do it, within the bounds, within what is legal. But I'm just trying to get us to think about the longer and deeper history here. So Judge Anderson endorsed this line of reasoning that Navajos don't have a religion. Not coincidentally, Alden J. Anderson was the judge who wrote this decision in 1977, was a devout member of the LDS Church and a direct descendant of LDS Apostle Ezra T. Benson, one of the first settlers of Salt Lake City Valley. Anderson clearly held views that aligned with the dominant society about what constituted religion and what didn't. Given his deep connection to the LDS Church and Christianity, Anderson's perception of organized religion was guided by his own uh, notion of what constituted religion. When the Navajo plaintiffs asked the court to stop tourists from, quote, acting in such a manner as to destroy and desecrate the Navajo gods and sacred sites threatened by the rising waters of Lake Powell and by the influx of tourists, it was really plausible that such notions didn't really register for Anderson on a deeper level. Anderson used his decision to remind Navajo plaintiffs that they were allowed to worship at Rainbow Bridge only as a courtesy from the National Park Service who managed the monument because Navajos held no state-sanctioned property interest in the case. So they don't have a legitimate religion and they don't have a property interest. And he's pretty explicit about that, not in a mean way, but just in a legally way, in a, in a way that is supported by legal documents at the time. Not surprisingly, Bedoni and the other plaintiffs appealed Anderson's ruling. They hoped that the Tenth Circuit Court would reach a different conclusion. Instead, in 1980, the Court of Appeals upheld the core of Anderson's decision. This um, final, this last court decision did not so much dismiss the charge that Navajo's freedom to practice their religion had been violated as much as they ruled that other issues dwarfed that right. So the, the second court kind of says, they kind of have a religion and yeah, they should be able to practice it there if they want to, but what's more important is the economic interest in the, in the, um, the, in the dam. So the court simply agreed, quote, with the trial court that the government's interest in maintaining the capacity at Lake Powell at a level that intrudes into the monument outweighs the plaintiff's religious interest in the case. This decision belied the fact that the water of Lake Powell and the development of religion also had spiritual overtones for non-indigenous people. It wasn't just indigenous people for whom the waters of Lake Powell potentially had some religious connotations. The difference was that such spiritual interests encompassed material development and were seen as an outgrowth of, or even a manifestation of a larger project of the development of the region. Elder Theodore Burton, oops, here Elder Theodore Burton's dedicatory prayer at Glen Canyon Dam, so this is the Glen Canyon Dam dedication ceremony, um, reflects this. He said, quote, may the power that comes on from the generators turn the wheels of industry to create new products, and may the light which goes on in the homes of men be reflected in the light which comes into their eyes, end quote. As a man of science and religion, Burton, who held a PhD in chemistry, attributed such enlightenment to God working through men, such as engineers and visionaries who created the dam, men like my grandfather, and I'm going to come back to that in a second. In turn, Burton hoped the electricity of the dam generated would spark God's enlightenment in humans. Such thoughts were mirrored by those in the, uh, people in the Bureau, uh, Bureau of Reclamation, including Floyd Dominey, the kind of controversial um, bureau director who nicknamed, him, nicknamed himself Floyd Domination. It tells us a little bit about his personality. Um, and he said, there was an important hierarchy at work in such projects. Quote, he said, there is a natural order in the universe. God created both man and nature, and man serves God, but nature serves man. To have a deep blue lake where there was no lake before seems to bring man closer to God. Thus, well, in the view of Latter-day Saints like Burton and non-LDS um, Christians like Domini, uh, Glen Canyon Dam was a public good but that also illustrated God's power to inspire engineers to design and build engineering marvels like the dam. 
The Bodoni case reveals the consequences of many different historical actions. In other words, the court's final decision wasn't necessarily inevitable, but given all that occurred before it, it was, kind of, it was certainly predictable. I want to end um, with a brief reflection about how my family's history now connects to the dam in unexpected to me ways that I discovered as I was doing research. So I'm going to come back now to my family foundations. All right. As I conducted my research, I discovered that Glen Canyon Dam was the first engineering pro project my grandfather worked on as an immigrant seeking refuge in the United States after World War II. My paternal grandfather, here he is, Franz Edwin Bazumek, um, was born in 1909. He was born in Schwarzburg, Germany, and he was a civil engineer by training prior to World War II. His wife, Ella Berwald Basumek, was raised by her grandmother in Elbing and was an early convert to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Germany in the 1920s. Edwin and Ella met in the early 1930s and married in 1935. And they then had four children, one of whom, there's my dad, he's got lederhosen on, yes, that's him. Um, uh, they had four children. They applied for a visa to come to the United States in 1952. They arrived with only what the family of six could carry in, four suit, in six suitcases. Um, and they had amassed a pretty substantial debt of $1,000 um, to the LDS family who sponsored them to come to the United States. So my grandfather had to learn how to speak English, um, which he did working odd jobs. And then in 1954, his first real job for Western Steel was to engineer rebar um, on Glen Canyon Dam. Um, this sparked a lifelong love of the Navajo Reservation, traveling throughout the Southwest, etc., in a little camper, which they had. Um, and I did not know any of this when I started the research on my book. I only found this out when I was doing research, and I was in Page, Arizona, and my dad said, when you get to the dam, call me. And I called him, and my father actually told me the story, which I was then to, able to document. My personal history is connected to the history that unfolded, that, just, that I just sort of explained, in ways that are complicated, but also pretty predictable if you study the American West. The American West is a place where immigrants come together, um, forge their way in a landscape. My mother's family are immigrants uh, to the region as well. They have a sort of different story. So my personal, while well, my personal ancestors, my grandfather, did not participate in removal, removing indigenous people from the land, my family and millions of others like us are beneficiaries of this process that occurred. So we are beneficiaries of the dispossession of the Ute and the Paiute and the Navajo and the Hopi and Puebloan peoples from their lands on the Colorado Plateau. And I just want to end with that acknowledgement because I think sometimes we can forget that our family, or sometimes our families just kind of ignore how the past is unfolded in ways that open up possibilities for us while they close them down for others. Um, and recognizing this process I think is important and it can help us build new foundations or repair other ones that are broken. So while the current crisis on the Colorado River is one that resolves around where will the West, the people of the West, get its water and um, power, that's a pressing issue for all the residents of the Colorado Plateau, not just the white residents who rely on the water of the Colorado River for power and for um, irrigation. So I guess what I'm saying in this book is, or this book is my attempt to say, what happens if we ask a new set of questions about water infrastructure and larger power relationships in the region? Um, and how can looking at the longer history of Glen Canyon Dam kind of help us reckon with that in some really interesting and fundamental ways that could impact policy? So I'll stop there and hopefully answer questions for you guys if you have them. Yes? Were any improvements made after that in hopes to kind of reconcile any relations with like the indigenous people of the Navajo Reservation? Did they ever lower water? Did they ever like allot times for them to have spiritual like ceremonies or is it still the same? So that court Okay, so she asked, were any improvements ever um, made to help indigenous people worship at Rainbow Bridge? That is that kind of what you're asking? Okay, so because of this court case. Legally, the National Park Service did not have to do this, but because this court case brought so much public pressure and stunts like the Jim Mike, where they bring Jim Mike back to Rainbow Bridge to kind of prove that um, uh, indigenous people were part of this process, 
Um, the National Park Service begins managing, um, trying to work more in, with the management of the region in and around Ra Rainbow Bridge. So now if you go to Rainbow Bridge, there are a whole bunch of signs saying, please do not, right? But there's not really an enforcement mechanism, right? Like, please do not discard your trash at Rainbow Bridge. Please do not swim under the bridge. Please do not do these things. So that is management that is occurring in conjunction with Navajo Nation and the Federal Parks and the National Park Service. Yeah. Um, I think there are people here in this audience who could better answer that question. Brendan <laughs> is probably um, better able to. He's not the only one. Um, it's a kind of complicated um, stew that you know settlers are trying to figure out how they want to interact with indigenous people. And indigenous people are trying to figure out, and I kind of go into detail of this in the book, um, you know, when it, when it benefits them to ally with LDS settlers, especially as that, you know, the Southern Paiute, the Paiute are facing lots of pressure from the Ute, from the Navajo, um, et cetera. And so sometimes it, it works to their benefit to forge an alliance with the LDS settlers. So yeah, it's, a, it's super complicated. Sure. No, I'm so glad you asked that. I actually end the book with um, Bears Ears, and I call Bears Ears an infrastructure of hope because it, as opposed to what happened at Rainbow Bridge National Monument where um, the land was taken without any say or input from all the indigenous people who were in the region who laid, had some sort of claim to it, Bears Ears was actually indigenous people coming together, petitioning the government, um, attempting to work with the settlers in that, you know, in and around that community to say, um, what happens if we take the lead in managing, but the government is, you know, with the, alongside the government? So I do think that that is a more hopeful model when we think of, when we look at this in terms of dispossession. So it's um, acknowledging that indigenous people still have a claim to that region and should have some say in how that region is managed, especially when it comes to sacred sites. Yeah. Interested in some of the economic benefits that were anticipated. I'm curious how how those anticipated economic benefits were towards their own dam maintenance or jobs. Those have played out in the way that they were anticipated and how uh, maybe the I mean I know it's broad to say like the now donations and attitudes. Yeah. Yeah, so um, it, they shift pretty quickly. Um, and so Raymond Nakai, I think I have a, well, um, the, there is a kind of, so if we're just talking about tribal council, there is a leader, there are a series of leaders who are kind of um, forward thinking, kind of embracing modernity as Glen Canyon Dam is being um, proposed. And they embrace this idea, like this is one way to bring water and electricity to Navajo Nation, we can get jobs, we can potentially get run concessions along the shoreline. But then they realize pretty quickly, um, not so much in dealing with the state of Utah, but in dealing with the states of Arizona who kind of block um, their attempts to, of Navajo, residents of the Navajo Nation to get some of those concessions. Um, they get pretty demoralized pretty quickly, and they realize they're going to get some jobs building. There are about a thousand workers who work on the construct Navajo workers who work on the construction of the dam, but those are temporary jobs, right? Because once the dam is built, those jobs go away. So the long-term jobs would have been running concessions, um, boat ramps, things along the shoreline, and they just don't get them. They just aren't awarded those concessions. Um, state the state of Arizona. Um, attempts to reclaim some land from Navajo Nation. Um, and Navajo Nation feels like they've been working in good faith. They've given the government and the states everything that they wanted and needed in order to get this dam. And they are hoping to get water and electricity from the dam. Um, parts of the Navajo Nation that are closest to the dam actually don't get water um, until 2014. 
And so the dam was completed in, in 1966. So there's a lot of, there was a fair amount of disillusionment about the, um, about the workings of the dam. And water across, water infrastructure across the Navajo Nation is not good even today. So the average American resident, um, Texas, Utah, we use about 80 gallons of water a day. The average um, resident of Navajo Nation uses about eight. Right, and that's water that's potted, that's um, trucked in, and they have to go and fill up. So the water infrastructure is sorely lacking, and we really saw there was a lot of news that maybe some of you may have um, seen when COVID hit that the lack of that water infrastructure had pretty disastrous impacts for Navajo Nation. If you can't wash your hands frequently, right, it's 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 kind of problematic. Good question. Thank you. Yes. Um, other sites, um, indigenous sites that were impacted by the reservoir? Um, well, so the, um, there were archaeological sites, rock art sites. Um, I mean, there were, the, the reason, there was actually, um, they called it a salvage operation that was run by um, Angus B. Woodbury, who, I don't know, Woodbury's kind of a famous name, some of you might know it, but he um, was an ecologist and um, one of the first uh, people to uh, work at Zion National Park, he actually ran a salvage operation where they went through and they tried to document all the rock art that was that has sort of special meaning for indigenous people, although not for that reason, they're trying to document it. And they just pull out as many archeological, um, archeolog as much archeological material as they can. So now there's a kind of recovery effort where um, groups are attempting to work with um, Navajo uh, and Southern Paiute um, along the Colorado River to, so that the river itself is sacred, and for many Navajos, damming up and blocking the river um, was, um, so Mark Maryboy is pretty vocal about this. He's a, um, a former uh, Navajo Nation, he, he worked in Navajo Nation government. He says, you know, that the river needs to be running free and this, is, this will be restorative to the nation or bring back the health of the nation, et cetera. So there are a whole, a whole like the river itself is sacred. There are a number of different sacred sites all throughout the region. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all right. Much.